I came across a motivational saying from someone who said one of the major problems that we have as human beings is that um, the motivational speakers that we have all over the place will say things like this to you, you can be anything you want to be. Have you heard that before? How many of us believe it? Uh, you people are suspecting me, so you're not answering me. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. I don't believe it because usually when a product is made, the vision of that product is in the heart of the maker. So the iPhone cannot now wake up with a motivational speech and say, I can be a pressure cooker. I can cook beans. You cannot cook beans. No matter how much you try, you cannot cook beans. So no matter how fired up a motivational speaker makes you, and I've been in some of those sessions where you know someone is speaking and you know it feels like you want to jump on the table it is after they've gone you say what did we hear i, I won't mention this man's name this this particular gentleman is a motivational speaker he's making waves a couple of years back in my work he had come and i, I promise you it was only to climb table that it remained in terms of the amount of energy this guy generated as in the noise, we can do it. We can, Nigeria can grow by 100% next year. Yes. So when he left, my MD called me. said, what was that? <laughs> so motivational speakers have a way of, you know, firing you up and actually appealing to your flesh. If you can claim it, you can do it. If you're going to retire to perspire the desire, then it's looking like, ah, it's, it's from heaven. Because it's rhyming. It's not true. So there's a reason God made you and I. There's a reason. And the extent to which we can blow in the world depends on how close we are to that reason. So if you decide to walk away, that's why the Bible says, delight yourself in the Lord. He will grant you the desires of your heart. Because when you're delighting yourself in God, He is laying on your heart what He wants. That's why the desires of your heart are fulfilled. So the more you delight... The more you get close, the better you are able to fulfill the vision. So where is this going, Sister Tolu? Uh, what do women want is what we want you to talk about. So the first thing I'm actually going to be doing today is what did the maker say about the woman? Because at times, um, young men in the house, married men in the house, at times we are busy trying to understand what it is that this person wants. How many of us know that there are times you want something you can't describe it? Can I see your hand? I'm in that category, Sha. And at work, it's a problem. Because many times I see something here and I'm trying to describe it. Some people catch it, some don't. And I keep saying, when I see it, I will know. Because it's somewhere there. So the Bible helps us because God is the one that made the woman. So the Bible actually puts a few things together. Mr. Man in the house. To understand the way you deal with a woman and to get the best of a woman. So that's the first thing I'll be doing this morning. And the second thing I'll do is, we also went to the marketplace. We went out, we went to the streets. And we asked questions of real women. What are you looking for? We asked single women, we asked married women. I'll share that with you. And then I'll end on the note, note of, so what now? What am I supposed to do? And I have stories here and there. I like to tell stories. I think they make the point. Okay, let's open our Bibles to First Peter. 1 Peter 3, 7. If you see me playing with my phone, I'm checking the time. Because I know also that I can talk a bit. 1 Peter 3, 7. I read from King James. It says, Likewise ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Let me give you in two other versions. I have the Passion Translation. It says, Husbands, you in turn must treat your wives with tenderness, viewing them as feminine partners who deserve to be honored for their co heirs with you of the divine grace. And then the Amplified Version. And the reason. I like to read different translations. Is I've, I've noticed over time that the different translations have a way they appeal to different generations. So if you became born again in the days that I became born again, and you cannot speak, you cannot speak King James. It's like you are not holy. 
Like, what do you mean you cannot quote Bible in King James? I don't understand. But if you are my children's age, they're wondering, what is this thing that you are speaking? Thou est, mayest, goest. It's not making sense. So it's always good to, you know, do that. Amplify. In the same way you married men should live considerately with your wives, with an intelligent recognition of the marriage relation, honoring the woman as physically weaker, but realizing that you are joint heirs of the grace of life. Order that your prayers may not be hindered and cut off. Praise the Lord. Okay, now, what did the maker say is where I'm starting? Now, a couple of things in that one verse that God you will have you as men understand and as women ruminate on. So the first thing Peter said here is, he said, likewise. And when you say likewise, it means you're comparing it to something. You're saying similar to what I said earlier. That's what Peter was saying. So for us to really understand what he was saying earlier, you have to backtrack a bit. So I backtracked and I ended at 1 Peter 3, 1. 1 Peter 3, 1, it's interesting because even there, it's saying likewise. It says, likewise ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of their wives. But again, the question remains, likewise to what? Because that's what got us to 1 Peter 3, 1. So I'm going to backtrack one more time. And then I'm going to go to 1 Peter 2. And I'll read from 23 to 25. 1 Peter 2, from 23 to 25. From 21 to 23, I beg your pardon. 1 Peter 2. And this is where Peter was referring to. It says, for you have been called for this purpose. Let me go back to my King James. 1 Peter 2. 21 to 23. It says, For even here unto were you called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example. So that is what Peter meant when he said likewise. That ye should follow his steps. That's what Peter meant. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Who when he was reviled, he reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. So the first thing that Peter is saying is, men in the house, you're asking the question, what do women want? The first thing, the first admonition of Peter is be like Christ. Ah, but how? Be like Christ. In the same way that Christ did deny yourself. Don't abuse your authority. Someone said if, if, the, if the purpose of something is not known, abuse is inevitable. So the, the purpose of your authority in the home is not for backing orders. Go and do this. After all, the Bible says you submit. Go and do that. After all, the Bible says you submit. I, I would joke with my friends that if a man continues to say, I am a man. I am the man in this house. Then that means there's a problem already. Because I don't understand. It's like, it's like the table continuing to say, I am a table, I am a table. That means you are doubting that maybe you are a table. So if a man is constantly going, I am the man. Respect me, I am the man. Already something is wonky there. It's not, it's not right. But Peter is saying, husband, don't abuse your authority. The Bible says that even though Jesus was the son of God, he thought it not robbery to be equal with God. He was humble. He did not use his authority wrongly. Actually, what Jesus tried to do while he was here was influence people. Like that woman at the well. A woman that most people did not want to talk to. Jesus drew her into conversation. Because he felt, if I can do this, she will believe me. Instead of going, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So men, what do women want? They want you to be like Christ. Who said that? God said that and God made women. So God understands that the deep yearning of a woman's heart is really around you looking like Jesus. Don't abuse your authority. Actually allow the, man, allow the woman. Allow her. So it's true you are the head of the home. It's true you, you are the one that has authority. But in real terms, allowing her to have her way is one of the ways in which you actually draw the woman to yourself. Women in the house, you need to help me if I'm saying your mind. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mama, Mama P. Thank you, Mama P. Yeah. So the heart of a godly man is actually to imitate his Savior. The deepest yearning, and I promise you, this may not come out in, in what you see in young ladies today. Eh? You may not necessarily see that people are thinking, I'm looking for a godly man. But the deepest yearning of a woman's heart is looking for that godlike person in her life. Because this woman, when in church, has already given their lives to Christ. They understand what it means to be a Christian. So the first thing this morning is likewise, be like Jesus. Now the second thing, we're still in that verse of scripture. The Bible says, dwell with them according to knowledge. That's interesting. Some other version says, know them intimately. Men in the house, your women want you to know them intimately. I will describe what that means. When you want to know something, what do you do? Help me, students. You study it. What else do you do with something you want to know? You pay attention. So, the Bible is the one that wrote this. Oh, It says, dwell with them according to knowledge. So, you cannot be dwelling with a woman naively. Like, why can't she be like me? No, 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 no. Dwell with a woman according to knowledge. Now, when you want to know and understand something, one of the things you do is observe. You may research about the, the thing. You will read the thing. Or you may ask people about it. You may ask people about it. Now, it is said that the average American couple spends about 37 minutes together every week in actual communication. So I want to give you an exercise. In this week, study the way you are living every day. And write it down somewhere. How well am I spending time with my wife? And really, I'm talking to the man. So, a woman sitting beside you to watch La Liga is not spending time with her. You're not discovering anything new about her. You are just shouting when the goal has entered. Or you are upset, depending on where you are, Chelsea, Arsenal, whatever. I'm very blessed. My husband does not follow any club. We follow the winning club. So, as, as they are shouting, I can shout. I don't even need to understand, you know, who is wearing blue or red. But it doesn't follow anything. So, when you really want to know something, like I was saying, you study it, you understand it. You spend time with that thing. That's why doctors spend seven years in the university. Because it's complicated. And guys, a woman is complicated. Take it from a woman. Abby? Now, Okay. So now, I, I heard a woman of God say, I, I mean, honestly, she's a woman of God I respect. She said, one minute, a woman is joyful. Like, yeah, bring it. The next minute, she's crying. It's like, what's wrong? Say, I don't even know. I just want to cry. Maybe I'll feel better if I cry. I am not joking. If you have not entered that age, just know that you are coming to meet it. So a woman is complicated. And the way you deal with a complex issue is you study because by studying, you can know it. The same way a doctor, even though medicine is complicated to some of us that are not, uh, you're like, ha, how does somebody go to school to just understand the way the body works? But if you sit there, you can know it. So I, I love research. And I went and I, you know, sort of dug up a few things. A few of them I've shared before, a few I have not. So I wanted to answer the question for myself. First of all, are men different from women? And the truth is yes. Not just in the way they behave, but in the way they were made. So researchers, psychologists would tell you that the way a woman's brain is fashioned is different from the way a man's brain is fashioned. And I'm telling you men in the house this morning so that you know that some of the things you see in your wife, Kofi Kashe, you know the meaning of that? She's not doing it out of spite or she's trying to wrong you. It's just the way things are. So one of the things I discovered, for example, is a woman's brain is on average 14% less than a man's brain. And researchers have said, well, that could be because of size. But all of a sudden, researchers said that men use their gray matter more than women. What that means is a man thinks like this. A woman thinks, I dropped the children in school. 
Somebody has ballet. I have to buy the shoes and ballet socks. I have to make my husband's dinner. He wants a dick I call this night. Then I have to make sure that the one that just started her period, I spent time with her. That is a woman's brain. If you go into biology, eh, it says that if, if you're a biologist here, eh, you can correct me later. Don't correct me now. It says that in the two different sides of the brain, a man's brain is wired this way. A woman's brain is wired this way. Go and read about it. So that's why. That's why a woman would do this and do that and do that and do that and do that and do that. Most women. Because the other thing I also need to say is, despite the fact that there is research available, not all women are the same. So you can't just carry, you can't just go and lock yourself up, say, I'm going to, I'm going to crack this thing. You now read it. You read women, women, women. Then you come out and your wife is different. You say, oh, why are you not looking like the other women? <laughs> not all women are the same. I can tell you for sure. So I am not one of those women that can multitask. I, and I say it proudly. And it's as bad as if I'm talking to somebody now and you pass me and you say hello, I may not hear. And that has given me a name to say, oh, she doesn't even greet. I didn't see you because I was focusing on the person that I was talking to. So women are not all the same, but there are some generalities. So the woman sees the big picture. The man has a laser focus, mostly. Now, this one has caused a lot of problem. Verbal, the verbal nerves in the brain, a man has it most likely on the left side of their brain. A woman has it on both sides. What do you think the implication is? Ah, it's not too much. We talk more. It's not too much. There's nothing too much. So when you say, how was work? Right? Simple question. Say, ah, the traffic in the morning. As I was going, the driver almost hit the person. Then my husband says, did they give you the approval? I say, wait now. So when I got to work, then I discovered I did not carry my breakfast. Then I had to go and look for uh, breakfast. Then, oh God, my coffee. I, it's like, <laughs> did they give you the approval? I say, wait now. Then I looked for my boss. Then they said my boss is coming. Then my boss said, let's have a phone meeting. Then as we were having the meeting, the, the network was not very clear. Then we were, said, did they give you the approval? I say, wait. Because I, I just want to take you on a journey with me. We, men, if you like yourself, go on that journey. Because what betide you when she finishes? And you now say, um, ha, did you see my did you see my note? You now say, What did you say happened when you were going? So you were not listening. <laughs> say, no, but I was listening. You didn't listen, sir. So the way to do it is this. Let me teach you. You say, how is work? First of all, don't start the conversation if all you have is 30 seconds. You can't be going, how is work? You want to get an answer and you move on. No. How is work is, wow, my husband wants to talk to me, wants to hear from me. Let's start. If I don't give you the story, who am I supposed to give? I don't understand. Who will I give the story to? Uh -uh. Did you take your neighbor's name? Eh? When I dropped my father's name to take your name, what did you think? You will, take, you will listen to my story. If you ask a man, how was the day? It was okay. So, then the woman will say, okay, how now? Okay, how? He said, okay. Kill it, do it so it was fine. Or, you know, don't mind my boss. He didn't. But, guys, this, there's a wiring in the brain that does that. A woman does not need to go to school to study verbs. They just ooze. They, they come out. That is why also gisting is one of the hobbies of a lot of women. You just, you know, you want to spend time with your girlfriend and just gist. Like, ah, just gist. Plenty, plenty, plenty things. Just gist. So that's the second thing. Now, the others I'm going to read have biological meanings, but I won't go there because of time. Women revisit memories more often. A woman will say to you, that is how you did on the 22nd of February, 1984, by 2 p.m. That's what you did. And you're like, yeah. <laughs> she, some of them don't even try, I'm telling you. They're not, it's not because they wrote it somewhere. It's just stamp in the brain. So it's not because the woman wants to keep a record of wrong. We're also on a journey. You are a work in progress. We are also work in progress. And some of those things will try and forget it eventually. 
I heard a woman of God say, some women even say, oh, don't you remember today's date? It's the anniversary of your adultery. <laughs> Three years ago, that's when. And it's not because they want to. Women have better memory power than men. Women need a combination of things to get aroused. And this is PG-13 or 18, I think. It's 18. <laughs> so, but I, I will be coded as much as I can. A man is visual. You see it, you go for it. A woman, from the morning, SMS. You are looking good. Thank you for my food. When are you coming home? Then you are watching TV, you are touching the hand. You know, so those combinations eventually can lead to what you are looking for. So it is not as easy as you married me and therefore, once we enter our bedroom, so it is. No, it's not, it's not like that. I, we're actually, there was a couple during one of our programs. I don't know if Dickiness would remember, but Dickiness would remember. During one of our couple meetings, and the girl said, my husband has said I cannot dress in front of him if I don't want anything. So I said, okay, if that is it, let's do it then. <laughs> because every time she attempts to change, the man interprets it as something else in the brain. It's like, yeah. Women need a combination of... Women are better at learning languages. They are better with numbers. Uh, men are better with numbers. Women are more sensitive. So a woman will enter a place and say, ah, didn't you notice she didn't greet me? The man will say, no, I did not notice. The woman will say, but she didn't greet you. I'm telling you, she didn't greet you. She looked at you somehow. Some of those things are exaggerated. Some are not. And a lot of times, I kid you not, I have said things that eventually... My husband will say, ah, you said this thing. I said, trust me, I'm a woman. Trust, you know, listen. Just listen to some of these things. So, men in the house, the Bible says, dwell with them according to knowledge. What I've done is to just share a few things with you. And if you are a single man, because I know that there are quite a few singles in the house. If you're a single man, just be thinking of it. Because if you're not ready to give time to knowing, knowing, the, um, knowing your wife, then there'll be problem because you will be wondering why she's not like you and she can't be like you now we're still going back first peter 3 7 it says giving honor unto the wife as the weaker vessel so one of the things the maker is telling men is the wife is a weaker vessel so treat her with care for those of you that travel you want to send your package ahead of you you put fragile on it so the maker said she is fragile some women are tougher than others, but generally, generally, giving honor to the woman as unto the weaker vessel. Weaker physically, and maybe weaker in some other things. The way you treat weaker is the way you should treat your wife. In other words, not constantly going, not constantly going, bow to, bow to me, bow to me, but doing it in such a way that she appreciates that what you want to do is actually love on her. I am rushing now already. Giving honor to the wife, that's number four, as unto the weaker vessel and as being co heirs So a woman is a co heir is an equal, she's an equal. When you talk about riches of Christ, she is an equal. So when you talk about being Christians, she is an equal. In the marriage relationship, the Bible requires that she submit. But in terms of life, in terms of being a Christian, the Bible recognizes that she is a co -heir. And the last thing, just to say from 1 Peter 3, 7, it says that your prayers be not hindered. Men, when you are loving on your wife, spending time to know her, treating her delicately like the fragile being that she is, you are actually serving the purposes of Jesus. Because without doing that, the Bible says that your prayers are hindered. So in other words, the reason you do those things is not because you want your prayers answered. The reason you do them is because the Bible says so because you love her. However, if you don't, there's a consequence. And the first consequence is that the temperature in your home will be high. And by temperature, I mean ongbono. I don't know how to say that in Igbo. I apologize. But it's, the house will be hot. 
And if, if you're a man of God seeking to love God, seeking to do good things with God, then you don't want your house to be hot. So you do these things and your prayers will be answered. So that is what the maker said about the woman. First Peter 3, 7, go there, study for yourself. Now, the second thing I wanted to say this morning is what did the women say? So we were able, we did a survey and um, we got 75 young ladies to fill the survey. About 60% of them are single. About the other remaining percentage are married. About 60% of them are below 30. They're 30 and below. The remaining are married. Now let me read, go to the next slide. And if it's not clear, I'll read from here. Thank you. Now these are the, so we, just, just two questions we said to them. What are you looking for in a man? What do you want? Now, the first item there is God-fearing. So remember 1 Peter 3, 7. So women are saying, and remember, this is not an interview. They don't mind whether you know what they're saying or not. It's a, it's a random, anonymous survey. And women are saying, I want a God-fearing man. Um, this particular survey, we did not give them a list to choose from. That would have been easier. But just to hear them express. But beyond God-fearing, we heard things like kindness. Honesty, smart, hardworking, responsible. A few people said wealthy. A few people said physical attractiveness. A few people said learned and successful. But the majority of what you have from the single girls. So even though the girl may be going, who are you? You know, you don't have a car. In the crux of it, she's looking for a man. Who is seeking after God? So these other things will be nice to have. In the crux of it, she wants a man who is after God. I'm sure some of you are wondering, who did Sister Tolu talk to? Maybe this is my time to go and approach those people. Maybe you have had some complex about, I don't have a car, I don't have this. This is what the girl said, without being watched. Now, can you go, to, yes, married. Now, when it came to married, almost the same trend. The heaviest was God-fearing. And these were the words, God-fearing, God-like, chasing God, loving God. These were the words they used. So most married women said God-fearing. But what you would notice here is, you know, as you get married, those fluffy stuff sort of fall away. You don't get many people saying wealthy again. You know why? Because people have discovered that even with money, you can have such a bad marriage. I have seen people live in mansions not happy. I've seen people very poor, very happy. So if you're here this morning as a young girl, you're thinking, uh, I don't want to repeat my mother's mistake. I don't want to marry a man who doesn't have money. You may be digging for yourself. You're digging a hole. If the first thing you're going to consider is whether or not, is whether or not the man has money. You're digging something for yourself. So the married guys, the majority said God-fearing. You see things like loving, smart, caring, responsible, understanding, patient, supportive, honest. Physical attractiveness comes up once. Ambitious comes up once. Then you hear respectful, confident, humble, disciplined. Again, there's godliness, there's character. So as married women... Ask the question, what do you admire the most about your man? It is mostly about these things that are mostly not tangible. It's not a man with iPhone. It's not a man with the latest car. It's a man that is loving God, chasing God, and becoming like God. That's what they said. Now, let me break it down a little bit, man. Just summarize it very quickly. God-fearing still tops the list for both categories. 28%. For the single, 16% for the married. You can drop this. Don't show the other slide yet. Thank you. You find more character than ephemeral things in the married category, like I said. And you find more ephemeral things in the single category earlier. Now, you know these numbers are very small. How many people are in Lagos? We surveyed 75. It's very small. But the trend is real. The trend that you see here is actually real. And I know in practical terms, like I said, you will still get a girl saying, you don't have car, I don't want to suffer, I don't like poverty. The Bible says one will chase a thousand, two will chase ten thousand. 
So there are times that the blessing on your marriage is what is required actually to move you forward, to move him forward. So you can't stay outside and be saying what I want is OTG, no, you know, food done ready, done done. I don't want to rule Larry. Because you may actually be cheating yourself. And to the men also who are going, I don't have a car yet so I can't approach a woman. I don't have this yet so I can't approach a woman. In real terms, if a woman sees that you are authentic and you're not busy trying to be like the Joneses, you're not trying to copy, your character will eventually speak for you. If a woman decides not to marry you because you don't have a car, she's not worthy of you actually. She's too vain. She's not the Proverbs 31 woman. She's not worthy of you. In fact, she's shallow. If a woman says, oh, all my boyfriends are usually fine. You're not as fine as them. You better run. You should be the one running. You shouldn't leave feeling bad. You should leave saying thank God. Thank God that she showed herself now. Okay, praise the Lord. So what now? We've heard from the maker. We've heard from the women. So many people have said, and I believe, that the choice of your marriage partner can make you, can kill you, kill your purpose, kill your destiny, and kill everything that you wanted to do. So it's very important that you sit down well and you do the calculation. You sit down well and you study. You sit down well, you don't go on the basis of what someone said so that later you say it's Pastor Pedro that uh, referred him to me. Did you outsource your spirit to Pastor Pedro? Did you outsource your mind to Pastor Pedro? Pastor Pedro can make your decision. Pastor Pedro cannot feel what the Holy Spirit is telling you here. You are the one that feels it. And if you are not feeling it, you better chase God so that you can feel it and you can understand what your father is saying to you. So what? So first of all, I want to address singles. And I said the so what is chase godliness. And I have some examples in the Bible. I look at, I look at Zechariah the father of John the Baptist because I'm trying to break godliness down what does it mean to be godly I probably will stop in the middle to make the point there was in the days of Herod the king of Judea a certain priest named Zacharias I will skip that verse 6 and they were both righteous before God walking in all the commandments verse 7 and they had no child because Elizabeth was barren so a man can be righteous seen to be good from the lenses of heaven but yet be barren but yet have no money. A godly man can be poor. So the motivational speakers that are saying to you, you can't serve my God and be poor, they are lying to you. And you can read your Bible. A godly man can be poor, a godly man can be barren, and it is not God punishing them. Okay. Verse 8, And it came to pass that while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his cause, other translations say when it was his time. So godliness means that you continue to serve God. You are met in the place of service. That is what Zechariah demonstrated to us. Let's look at Joseph. Another example of godliness as a man. Something that you can be looking at to cultivate as a woman. Something you should be looking for because that's what your maker said actually. Joseph, in Matthew 1.19. The Bible says when, when Mary was found to be pregnant. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example was minded to put her away privily. So a godly man covers up the shame of his wife. A, co a godly man protects the wife. We read about it. She's the weaker vessel protect. A godly man protects his wife from in-laws. A godly man protects his wife from elements. Whatever it is. You can see social media, you can see the TV is constantly putting the woman down if she's not showing skin. It's constantly putting the woman down if she has put on a few, um, a few pounds. A godly man protects that woman. You don't allow her to be messed up. You don't go to a family gathering and go and share what she did wrong the last time. We've heard the story of a man who was married to this woman and she didn't know how to cook. They had guests. The woman tried and tried. She cooked. The husband tasted the soup before serving the guest. He saw that the soup was bitter. He then pretended to fall down with a pot of soup. So that embarrassment can be saved both him and his wife. But mostly the wife. That's the way to do it. You, you hide your wife. You stand in front of your wife and you say, talk to me instead. A godly man does that. 
Now, a godly man has integrity. And integrity is what you do when no one is watching. And when you don't even know, they will ever know what you did. That's integrity. I heard the story of a pastor, and this is a pastor I know. I, w- I was going to say personally, but a pastor that I've sat under his teaching in South Africa, who said years back, and he preached on it. It's on YouTube. He said that a woman had come to him for counseling. And he, um, he counseled the woman. But instead of the woman coming with a genuine problem, the woman says, actually, when you stand on the stage and you are preaching, I don't see a man of God. I see somebody I can date. And, and she broke it down more than that. So I'll leave it there. So the man thought, ah, no, no, I, you, you, I'm sorry, you know, prayed with her. And he said to himself, my wife must never hear this, you know. But he discovered that as he then preached every Sunday, he was also now drawn to the woman. So he was, and this is, a, this is a big man of God, eh? He was drawn to the woman. So that was when he said, I, I, I will tell my wife now. I cannot be the only one. So he told his wife, they held hands, they prayed. And eventually they had to tell the elders of the church. And what the elders of the church then did was they approached this woman and they said, we like you, we love you, we love your spirit. But we think there's a church down the road. The pastor is 75 years old. When, when he's preaching, you will see a man of God. <laughs> In fact, you see a father. So they sort of advised her to leave the church. Right? This man did not have to say anything. You can just enjoy the accolades by yourself. Say, so that even when your wife messes up, and he said this, that when his wife would do something to him, he would say, look at her, me that they are wanting. <laughs> me that people are wanting. They are treating me somehow. So, but he did not have to say it, but he said it. Joseph did not have to run, no. When Potiphar's wife grabbed him, guess what? He would have been promoted to chief house boy. Because he's the one helping madame. And madame will tell the husband, this Joseph is very helpful. He's very helpful. When you are traveling, he's the one that should be in the house. Right? But imagine destiny. Destiny was calling Joseph to prime minister. And for a morsel of bread, Joseph would have become chief house boy. So a godly man has integrity when no man is watching. I attended an event yesterday and people had been invited to talk. And it was not a spiritual event. But I found myself speaking in tongues because these people, somehow, all of them were Christians. Somehow, all of them were, were going God, 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 God. Integrity will take you far. So even if you have approached 10 women and the 10 of them have, have you know, they've, I don't know how to say it in English. The 10 of them have, they've given you a show. How do you say that in English? They've, they, yeah. It, is it nailed there? Eh? They've nailed you. They've looked at you like, who are you? Keep going. Was it Jimmy Swaggart or Billy Graham that said he was preaching once and his wife noticed that somewhere during the preaching he derailed. So after she then asked him, what happened? And Billy Graham, I think it's Billy Graham, he then said, actually, I saw a woman in the crowd, the woman I I actually first proposed to. So he derailed, right? So Billy Graham's wife walks to the woman and says, thank you very much. See what you missed. If you're a man here, And you have girls doing like this to you in years to come. Your wife will approach them and say, thank you for leaving this man of God for me. That's what you missed. Integrity will give you that. The other thing is teachability. I am rushing. Ah. Teachability. The the godliness. You know, when you say, "What, what do you look for in a man? What should I do as a man? As a man in the house, are you teachable? Do you listen to counsel and change your mind as a result? Or are you the kind of person that nobody can talk to? As women in the house, the, one of the first things you should be asking if you're not married is who is your Olubawi, Olubawi in Yoruba? Who is that person that you will listen to when you don't listen to any other person? David was about to go and commit all kinds of murder. Abigail was not even his wife. When Abigail approached him and said, my Lord, don't do this. Don't let the blood of this man be on your hand. The man is stupid already. Let's leave him. But don't do it. And David listened. There's nothing in there for him to listen. He listened. So does this man listen and do you listen? The other things that you should therefore look out for and as a man you should aim for, respect and care for others. If a man does not respect his mother or care for his mother, young ladies in the house, he's not going to respect you or care for your mother. So if a man can leave his mother and not provide for his mother, the mother has saw him through school, your own is coming, you know? 
the broom that they used, is it broom, cane? The cane that they used to beat the mother, they're coming to use it on you. So respect and care. And one of the ways in which I have seen that people say you can know respect is, you go to a restaurant, how does this man treat the waiter? How does this man treat the house girl in their house? How does this man treat Agbero? <laughs> Someone said yesterday that, have you entered a bus before and two people are fighting? And one of them is said, do you know who I am? Say, who are you inside bus? <laughs> do you know who I am? Oh, no, I don't understand. <laughs> Selflessness. If you go on a date with this young man you want to marry, and out of one hour, he talks for 50 minutes. He's giving you sign, oh. And as a man also, pinch yourself if that's what you're always doing. And then hard working. Hard working is not about riches, actually. Hard working is about you understand that you need to provide for your family and you do what you need to do to provide for your family. It doesn't mean that your wife can't be richer than you. Your wife can be richer than you. In fact, go and look at studies. Women are coming up. So if you're a man whose pride has been based on the fact that women cannot make it, that world has gone, no? Women are going to school. Women are passing. Their results are much better. Women are making money. So you had better get ready for a woman that is equally as successful or more successful than you. And it still does not remove that thing about providing for your house. You still have to provide. Hey, but she's richer. The Bible says you provide. And so you do. Please don't ignore the red flags. And I say this from a deep place of my heart. If you're single here, thank God for your life. You have an opportunity to make things right. If a man is doing like this and wants to slap you and does not slap you and says, ah, lucky you, do better run. Carry your bag, carry your shoes, remove your wig so that you can run well. Run, he's going to beat, he's going to beat you black and blue. I promise you. Don't ignore red flags. If a man, if you ask a man, when last did you talk to your mother and he can't remember, that's a red flag. If a man constantly turns to look at a woman, every single woman that passes, the man turns. It's a red flag. Because it takes discipline and self-control not to look. Do you understand? When you just, you have covenant with your eyes and you say, I look at my wife only. So don't ignore red flags. Don't, don't, don't go, he will change. When you come to the altar and you say, I do. I do does not mean I will change you. And you're not the Holy Spirit. So you cannot change any man. If his mother and father could not change him for 20 something years or 30 something years or 40 something years, it is you now that you change him. What do you think you have? For, for married people, very quickly, evaluate your affections. I mean, if, if what you really want to do is have a solid home, evaluate your affections. If you find that your heart is starting to go after someone that's not your man or not your husband or wife, you are committing adultery. Because adultery is not just physical. Adultery is not just physical. A young lady approached me years ago and said, boss, she was working for me. Um, my husband is outside the country. When I call him, he doesn't pick. But there's this young man in Nigeria who listens to me. And I'm, we've gone out twice. I'm going out this evening. What do you think? I said to her, what do you think? I said, tell me your heart or your body is not doing somehow. She said, eh, somehow shy. I said, eh, so you have your answer. Now what are you doing? So if you are constantly looking forward to the weekend to be over, you're constantly complimenting that single lady that works for you. You're constantly trying to buy her gifts, finding out her birthday, what she likes and does not like. Evaluate your affections, oh married man. Evaluate your affections, oh married woman. Keep working at loving each other. Everything good takes work. Everything good. Years ago, I lost about 15 kilos. But it took a lot of work. Like walk. Like you see bread at Gege and you say no. You know, be gone, right? So everything, I mean, I, I like the result, but the question is, did I keep up the work? Everything good comes with work. So do the work that you need to do. I will not finish from married people. Now, to conclude, there was a fictional story I read. And it says in your mind, just imagine that there's a shopping mall that has six floors. And that shopping mall is called Husband Mart. In other words, husbands are up for sale in that shopping mall. The rule is this. If you go to one floor, you like what is there, you take your man from there. But once you move up, you cannot go back, right? So the first floor, a woman goes, and here they say the men have jobs. She's like, oh, that's great. But who knows what's on the second floor? So she climbed. 
Second floor, they say the women, the men here, they have jobs and they love kids. He's like, wow. But maybe it's better on the third floor. He said, these men, they have jobs, they love kids, and they are good looking. Like, wow, I like that. But let's see what's on floor four. Maybe four would be better. Oh, Lord. Ah, these men have jobs, they love kids, they're good looking, and they help with housework. Ah, are you kidding me? Should you not just stay there? She's like, ah, but there are six floors, so let me go, let me go, floor five. Ah, they love, they, they have jobs, they love kids, they're good looking, they help with the housework, and they're romantic. It's like, but she's like, oh, no, but let me go to floor six. She arrives at floor six. They greet her and they say, you have visitor 1 billion, 12 million, 345 to this floor. There are no men on this floor. This floor exists solely to prove to women. Solely to prove, sorry, that women are impossible to please. I don't agree. <laughs> I don't agree that women are impossible to please. But what I believe is there are times we are looking for the perfect package. There's no perfect package anywhere. Usually, the way things look at the beginning is nothing like the way they're going to look in 40 years time so usually even when god gives you a dream guys you don't even know it imagine the dream joseph saw he said the uh, moon and star and uh, something something bowing down is that equal to prime minister he will never have known so if your heart is going somewhere now as a woman your heart is going somewhere but you're nervous you're like i, I don't see it I don't see the prospect. God keeps it away from you so that you can keep your eyes on what really matters. I pray that God will help us, will ginger in us the right kind of desires that our choices will be correct. Shall you rise to your feet? I want us to pray one minute and I'm off. Just rise to your feet. I want you to just say to God, thank God for the word, whatever God has spoken to you this morning. Thank God for that word and you say, God, give me the grace. Give me the grace to do the right thing. As a married woman, married man, give me the grace to do the right thing. As a single person, give me the grace to do the right thing. And can you spend some time also to pray?